Welcome to this special broadcast on Times Network. I have a very special guest with me today. I have uh, Mr. Nilesh Shah from Kotak with me. Sir, thank you so much for joining us and it's a pleasure having you on this show. First of all, I want to start with a macro question, sir, because uh, I mean, we have seen what, what is happening around the world in all economies. While the inflationary pressure seems to have eased a bit and markets are definitely breathing a sigh of relief. As far as India is concerned, it seems to be in a good place, uh, fundamentally, uh, macro point of view. What is your take on Indian economy right now? So, Meher Bhai, thank you for inviting me over here. Pleasure, sir. As you correctly mentioned, India is truly an oasis in the desert. If you look at globally, the news is full of doom and gloom. One-sixth of American household are late in payment of utility bills. In Germany, government can't transfer more than 100,000 transactions a day to its citizens' accounts. In UK, they are removing expired food labels so that needy people can come and buy those expired food products. In Russia, oligarchs who criticize government, they have been dying in suspicious circumstances. China real estate, zero COVID policy creates doubt on growth. In that globally doomed scenario, India is truly standing like oasis in the desert. Six out of top 10 fastest growing cities are now in India. Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, Chennai, Hyderabad, and Bengaluru. Four out of top 10 fastest construction activity for commercial space is in India. Hyderabad, Bangalore, Chennai, and Delhi NCR. If cities do well, if states do well, undoubtedly India will do well. And let me just end this with one point. Today's Maharashtra is equivalent to India's GDP in 2005, just 16 years back. Today's Uttarakhand and UP combined is equivalent to 2001 India's GDP. And today's Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and Gujarat are equivalent to 2000 India's GDP. Can this five states over the next 15 to 20 years be equivalent to today's Indian GDP? Answer is quite likely. So this five states alone will pull India's GDP by about five times over the next 15 to 20 years. That's the long-term India growth story. Right. Uh, I think uh, that is what is, uh, sir, reflecting in the uh, markets also. I mean, barring the uh, uh, short-term fluctuations, the markets have had a good run. I think uh, earnings, the next earning seasons also, when we get into it, will probably reflect that. Uh, currently, what is your sense on uh, Indian markets? So, undoubtedly, Indian markets have done exceptionally well. Our market share in BRICS market cap was about 14% in 2014. Last, when I checked about a month or two back, it was 22%. In MSCI emerging market, our share went up from 7% to 16% between 2014 to 2022. This has meant that Indian markets have gone up and other markets have actually fallen. We traded at about 40% premium to MSCI emerging market peers. When I last looked at it, it was at 86% premium. So our markets are trading at a marginal premium to our own long-term average, but a substantial premium to emerging market peers on a one-year basis. If I have to put this conundrum in a very simple word, there will be traders who will be tempted to invest outside of India from the global allocation point of view because India does look expensive vis-a-vis -vis emerging market peers on a one-year basis. But there will be long-term investors globally who will be investing in India on a strategic basis, on a five-year, ten-year basis because this is one economy which is on its way up. You are right, because we have seen that, you know, while there have been some concerns about the valuations in India, but it is backed by growth. The bigger question is, in the, you know, second half of this financial year or maybe early part of next calendar year, 
डू यू सी सिचुएशन चेंजिंग मच बिकॉज वाइल इन्फ्लेशनरी प्रेशर्स हैव ईस्ट द रशिया यूक्रेन वॉर इज स्टिल गोइंग ऑन इट इज सेटलिंग डाउन इन टू अचुएशन वेर इट लुक्स लाइक अ प्रोलॉन्ग्ड वॉर विच विल हैव स्पर्ट्स इन टर्म्स ऑफ इट्स इम्पैक्ट ऑन मे बी कमोडिटी प्राइजेज एंड क्रूड and in the middle of all this india is taking over the g20 presidency so obviously it's a challenging uh, global scenario right now what is your expectation for the early next year uh, in terms of global growth and for india so we're by will have to brace for volatility there are multiple factors that play russia ukraine you rightly pointed out will it escalate or will it die down who knows the second thing is central bankers around the world led by us fed market is compelling fed to commit on cutting interest rate as growth is slowing down and fed is trying to preempt market from not compelling it many a times fed's behavior is walking left and talking right the press release or fomc minutes are painting a dovish or a balanced picture but the press conference of fed chairman or press statements of other fed members are fairly hawkish in nature on top of it we also have china conundrum thanks to their zero covid policy commodity consumption slowed down china is 50% consumer of commodity in most commodities now they are opening up and that could result into higher demand for commodities and in turn support the prices so my feeling is that today we are not having sight of vision on russia ukraine situation on global central banks response towards inflation and growth and china opening up all these three things put together will continue to impact the global economy and will have to brace for volatility let us hope and pray that russia ukraine gets resolved thanks to india let's assume that us fed is able to maintain balance between inflation and growth and china continues to take corrective action which may slow down growth in the real in the short to medium term but lays the foundation for a longer term growth right so sir in the middle of all this what kind of uh, earnings expectation you have from indian companies uh, going forward because we did see a very reassuring consumer demand especially during festive season the marriage season is also booming right from flights to hotels to tourist spots uh, you know i mean you can see the rush which means there is a fundamental buoyancy as far as indian economy is concerned what is your expectation particularly on indian economy so indian economy is doing well from a investment and consumption point to view but the recovery is k shaped on investment side government is spending money but private capex is subdued on consumption side top end of the society upper middle end of the society is consuming but the bottom end of the society is not consuming as before suvs have waiting periods of up to 1 year and entry level bikes are not getting sold as much as probably you know pre covid level now in this kind of scenario undoubtedly there is pressure on broad basing the economic recovery the festival season has been a good indicator towards broad basing of recovery wedding season also could spur our economy but overall we need to ensure that we follow appropriate policies and take corrective action on a very very proactive basis to ensure that india continues to remain oasis in this global desert right sir can we come since you mentioned policy can we comfortably say that uh, the fastest pace of rate hike cycle be it rbi or even other central banks uh, is comfortably behind us because obviously there are indications and various central bankers have indicated that can we confidently say that the pace the fastest pace of rate hikes is behind us now so there is a proverb in gujarati which says that hariyo jugari bamnu rame hmm a gambler who has lost will not mind doubling down his uh, doubling down his bet now this is very very important most central bankers globally 
bearing exception of the Reserve Bank of India, have lost their credibility in managing inflation. First, they say inflation is not there. Then they say it is transitory inflation. And third, finally, they realize that they have to take corrective action as genie is out of the bottle. Now, will Fed or other central bankers double down on controlling inflation to build their credibility? In that scenario, we will see growth getting hit hard. Anyway, growth is suffering from energy prices and withdrawal of fiscal stimulus in Western world. So we are at a very precarious position where central bankers have to build credibility, control inflation, and also manage growth. My feeling is that most central bankers will be willing to commit type one error, which is raising interest rates and controlling inflation at the cost of growth, rather than type two error, where they don't raise interest rates, let inflation persist in order to support growth. So we will have to be very, very careful. Now, sir, in this case, I want to talk about uh, the rupee situation because it seems to have settled at 80 plus levels, which used to be unthinkable maybe a couple of years back. Uh, but not that India is the only country which whose currency has sort of depreciated. We have seen that uh, across the world. But in the current context where uh, <clears throat> we do have a situation where inflation is higher than the comfort level uh, for the central bankers, uh, there is a demand for dollar, there is a demand for commodities like gold, which are continuing. And if the kind of boom we are witnessing at the high end of the consumption, you know, it may sustain at those levels. In that context, how do you see the rupee dollar equation playing out? So in our mind, we have no doubt that destiny of rupee is to depreciate. This was true 50 years back. This is true 10 years back. This will be true probably in next 10 years also. The reason why we believe rupees destiny is to depreciate is because of the inflation and productivity difference. Mm. Globally, inflation, especially among our trading partners, is in low single digit. Our inflation targeting is in mid single digit. Now, put together this two, will rupee have to depreciate to compensate for the inflation differential? Answer is undoubtedly yes. The second thing is related to productivity. Clearly, our productivity legs behind other trading partners. A China will construct a metro rail probably in one year. We will take same thing to complete probably in five years. Now, unless until we bridge this gap of inflation and productivity differentia, the rupee depreciation is necessary. And in rupee, we have been following probably the best policy globally, where central bank intervenes only to control volatility of the currency and let market decide the direction. Market forces should determine what is the fair value of rupee and central bank, like they have done always, focus on managing the volatility so that both importer as well as exporter does not necessarily end up taking a panic view. Right. Sir, in that situation, uh, because India happens to be one of the heavy consumers of gold, and heavy importers also of gold. What happens to uh, you know the gold craze in India? So, nearby gold is India's Achilles heel. In 21 years of this century, we have imported on a net basis 373 billion dollar of gold. This is after excluding jewelry exports. We also know that there is gold smuggling because there is about 16 percent incidence of taxes. Based on the gold seized at custom data, and assuming that gold smugglers are not charitable organizations, they need to import about $7 billion of gold this year so that they can have break-even. We also know when we are returning from abroad that many travelers wear jewelry and pass through Green Channel. So it won't be a surprise if India has spent $500 billion in 21 years of this century, towards imports of precious metal like gold and silver, 
and precious stone like diamond and pearl. India is a patient which has gone to hospital to recover its health, but is insisting upon blood donation. We have sent more money abroad for import of gold than all the foreign direct investment we have received. Indians are betting upon gold, whereas we should be betting upon our golden entrepreneurs who are creating value. This $500 billion outflow, this misallocation of $500 billion of Indian savings, if it was invested in bank deposits, mutual funds, stocks, debentures, bonds, then Indian economy would have been far higher than what it is today. There is a need to manage this obsession with gold. Jandan, simpler KYC have already laid the foundation. Now we need to attack where the problem persists, and that is the black economy. Majority of gold which Indians own is in black economy. We need gold disclosure scheme and tighter monitoring of physical gold to ensure that our debt capital stuck in Tijori, in gold, silver, diamond, pearl is actually converted to financial savings and it starts circulating in economy. Let the domestic savings bank, domestic entrepreneurs, that will create golden era for India. Absolutely. In fact, in that uh, context, I had one question because we have recently seen the pilot launch of the digital rupee also. Going forward, uh, do you see some sort of regulatory framework where the digital currency can be effectively utilized for, let's say, real estate or gold uh, kind of transactions uh, where even now there is a possibility of uh, gray market transactions? So, I think by and large general people have adopted, you know, digital payment system as reflected into UPI transactions. However, there is a class of Indian who still believe that India is not an independent country and if they pay taxes in India, it will go to British government. They need to be educated that this is your own country. It's independent for the last 75 years. And if you don't pay tax, it's a crime. This is the kind of people who are using cash economy to buy gold, to park their you know, illegal gains in precious stones, precious metals. Now, they are not going to adopt digital rupee because they don't want to pay tax because they have generated income through illegal way. So we need to figure out how we do a gold disclosure scheme whereby people are incentivized to disclose their gold, pay tax, and use that converted capital which has moved from black economy to white economy for growth of Indian economy. We can't be only dependent upon foreign capital to drive incremental growth. We need to back it up with domestic capital as well. Absolutely. In that, in, in that case, uh, do you think maybe the instruments like, let's say, a gold ETF uh, or REITs, they need to be uh, uh, promoted uh, much more than what they are right now at this point? Mirbai uh, gold ETF will still go and invest into gold and which in all likelihood will be imported gold. What we need to encourage is the recycling of gold. You and I both will have some gold which we don't even know which our wives would have purchased at home. How do we recycle the gold? The jewellery is by and large lying in the bank lockers and then there is a parallel economic gold. We have to recycle that gold so that the demand, the genuine demand of gold for jewellery is met through the recycled gold. Absolutely. That's very interesting. Uh, one final question from you, sir. Given, uh, given the current scenario and the way, you, like you rightly mentioned, the world is in a slightly uh, unpredictable scenario, be it China's zero COVID policy, be it Russia-Ukraine war, or even the way central bankers have behaved. Can we expect uh, a sustained outperformance uh, in terms of growth uh, and development of Indian economy for, let's say, next four to five years? Because it may turn out to be a very crucial window for India to break out uh, ahead of uh, the $5 trillion mark of economy as well. Undoubtedly, nearby, no matter how the pitch will be, I'm sure India will bet like Virat Kohli against Pakistan match 
and still win from a difficult situation. We have everything going for us. Global investors are willing to invest in India. China plus one and Europe one has created an opportunity on the manufacturing side. Our services expertise is accepted all over the world in IT. Remittances this year, India is likely to cross $100 billion. So overall, we have all the ingredients necessary. And I presume that despite challenging situation globally, we will continue to lead the growth. From the coach to the global growth train, now we have become engine. Our global fare in GDP is about 3.5% but incrementally will contribute substantially more than that to global growth. Pehle, Meher Bhai, dunia grow karti thi, to hum grow karte the. Right. Now, we have to grow so that the world can also grow. <laughs> That's very well said, sir. Thank you so much for joining us on this show. It was a pleasure having you on this show and let's hope the Virat Kohli or the Indian economy continues to bat at its best. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 